Okay, good evening again, everybody. My name is Christina Medved. I'm the Director of Community Outreach for Roaring for Conservancy. We're really happy to have you all here tonight, um, safely and comfortably from your own homes, thanks to the great snowstorm that we're getting today. Uh, I especially want to thank David and April for joining us tonight as well and sharing their knowledge with all of us. There's so many questions about root eye. Uh, we at the Conservancy get a lot of questions about the water in Rudai and why are the flows on the frying pan the way that they are throughout the year. So we're really excited. We put this together to help answer a lot of those questions. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to go ahead and give you a brief introduction to Roaring for Conservancy and the work that we do. So I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen here and get us get us started. I'll, I'll do a quick intro and then I will turn the rest of the evening over to April and David. Okay, so the Roaring for Conservancy is located on the western slope of Colorado. This little blue bubble that you see here um, is where we're located. Our watershed is roughly 1,400 square miles, about the size of the state of Rhode Island. And we might be a small watershed in the context of the bigger state of Colorado, but we are a very important headwater to the Colorado River, especially, most especially because of our elevation. We have seven 14ers just in this watershed alone that on really good years and normal years, we can hold on to snow well into the summer months, which is vital considering Colorado receives 80% of its water supply from snow. The mission of the Roaring for Conservancy is to inspire individuals to explore value and protect the Roaring Fork watershed. And we do that primarily through our watershed science and policy programs and our watershed education programs. Our watershed science encompasses everything from stream monitoring to targeted research projects, targeted studies, and those that science in particular addresses, um, informs our policy work where we engage with all stakeholders to come up with solutions to improve our streams and rivers. Our watershed education programs, uh, we reach over 6,000 individuals a year through our kindergarten, through high school aged programs, but also through our adult and community programs and family programs such as this one, and you could read a lot more about our programs and our work on our website. Let me give you a brief watershed tour. Um, this is uh, the 1400 square mile watershed of the Roaring Fork River. And I'll give you a quick little tour here. We have three major rivers. This dark blue one here is the Roaring Fork River, which begins near Independence Pass and flows through the city of Aspen before it gets to Basalt where it has the confluence with the Frying Pan River. The Frying Pan River begins here, this whole area. And maybe David and April will talk a little bit more about that during their presentations. And then once we're back on the Roaring Fork River, uh, we float down through Carbondale, where there is the confluence with the Crystal River. The Crystal River begins here um, in Gunnison County and flows 40 miles before it gets to Carbondale. Ultimately, the Roaring Fork River, after its about 75 mile venture from Independence Pass to Glenwood, will flow into the Colorado River. So in addition to some of the, our famous landmarks, if you will, being Aspen and some of the hot springs, the Maroon Bells, which is the most photographed mountain range in North America, also calls the Roaring Fork watershed its home. And I just wanna bring it back to this, to this image um, to also show you, um, I just, where exactly Root Eye Reservoir is on the Frying Pan River. So you can see that right here, just as a little caption, and I, I'm pretty sure April and David will go into more details about this. So, you know, we might have a small watershed in the context of the much bigger Colorado River Basin, but we have a very important watershed here, uh, given that our water is helping feed 40 million people in the American West. And so in 2019, we started this Brookshire Watershed Institute so that we can bring to you, uh, to the public especially, water leaders from a local, regional, national, and even international level to talk about water issues. Um, and then we'll address them. We'll always bring them back home to the Roaring Fork Watershed. Um, this one, this talk in particular already has that focus on it. And so I'm um, gonna go ahead and introduce to you tonight both of our speakers as they go ahead and get their screens 
ready to share with you all. So April Long is a professional engineer with more than 20 years of experience assisting local governments in the establishment and operation of stormwater, river health, and watershed management programs. She's a successful program and project manager trained in group facilitation, consensus building and leadership, and skilled in strategic planning, idea creation, policy making, and problem solving. For the past 15 years, April has served as the creator and manager of the City of Aspen's Clean River Program. In 2018, she started her own consulting firm, maybe you've heard of it, called Colorado Watermark LLC, and began serving as the executive director of the Rudai Water and Power Authority, which is made up of, which is a board of local elected officials in the Roaring Fork watershed that works in the development of programs, policies, and projects for the protection of local water resources. In 2019, April was appointed by Governor Polis to the state's Water Quality Control Commission, which she chaired in 2023. She also serves as the legislative appointee to the Colorado River Basin Roundtable and the Secretary of Northwest COG's Quality Quantity Committee. When not working to protect our beautiful rivers, April is usually hiking, rafting, or camping near them with her family. Thanks so much for being here, April. I'm going to go ahead and introduce David real quick. That way you guys can just transition completely over. And feel free, April, to go ahead and bring up your, share your screen. David Graff has been working as the in-stream flow coordinator for the Upper Colorado River Endangered Fish Recovery Program for a little over two years following a 22 plus year career as the regional water specialist for Colorado Parks and Wildlife, formerly the Division of Wildlife. His duties with CPW included water right management, hydrologic and geomorphologic inquiries, and as liaison to the Colorado Water Conservation Board's Western Slope Basin Roundtables since their inception in 2005. Bringing an applied science approach, David has participated in an array of multidisciplinary stakeholder work groups and subcommittees that were formed by roundtables to become better informed about regional or local water problems, and notably, to work cooperatively to plan and implement projects that were important to a variety of local water users. The Upper Colorado River Recovery Program relies on many partners to help get the work done. And these prior experiences have engendered an opportunistic, all of the above approach to managing current and future flows for rare native fish in the Upper Colorado River Basin. Dave has a Bachelor of Arts in Economics from Middlebury College and a Master of Science in Watershed Science from Colorado State University. David has prior experience in construction, outdoor, outdoor retail and teaching, and has greatly appreciated his this diversity of backgrounds to inform the collaborative efforts he's been a part of for over the years. He enjoys many forms of outdoor activities and lives in Loma, Colorado, where there is easy access to open space, big skies, and the nearby Colorado River. It's so great to have you both here together co-presenting. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and turn it all over to you both. Awesome. Thank you. Christina, can you hear me okay? And you can see my screen just fine. Okay, excellent. Um, thanks everybody for having us. Dave um, and I have known each other and have been working together for a while. And hopefully you will get a glimpse into the ways that we have to communicate and work together as we talk about this, um, this interesting piece of the puzzle that is Rudai Reservoir and the frying pan, Lower Roaring Fork and Colorado Rivers. Um, Dave, I've never heard your introduction done like that before. You're kind of a renaissance man. I didn't realize. I should have known. <laughs> All right. Um, so as Christina said, I'm April Long. I'm the director of the Rudai Water and Power Authority. Um, the joke for us is that we have no water, no power, and no authority. But we do, <laughs> we do have just a little bit of water and we do work in the protection of the water resources for the entire Roaring Fork watershed, not just for Rudai Reservoir, though the work that we do in Rudai Reservoir with Rudai um, is a lot, takes up a lot of my time um, and rightly so. It's a really important resource that has um, a great impact to our watershed. Um, you'll hear me talk about the Rudai Water and Power Authority as Rawapa, R-W-A-P-A. So that's the uh, Simple, simple way of saying all of that word jumble. Um, I was just looking at my picture here on the screen and I borrow pictures from the internet. I hope that I'm in a, a large majority there where everybody borrows pictures from the internet and I try to give credit where credit is due. 
This one came from the Basalt Chamber of Commerce, and I think it's AI generated. Um, I was looking at it a little closer, so it looks like it might be painted a little bit, but that's a great representation of Rudai Reservoir. All right. So um, to get us started, we are going to be talking about Rudai Reservoir in relation to something called the 15 mile reach a lot tonight. And so I wanted to orient us as to what the 15 mile reach is. And so let's start with where Rudai Reservoir sits. So Christina showed you where we sat within the Roaring Fork watershed. Um, similarly situated here is the Roaring Fork watershed and Rudai Reservoir here. This is the lower frying pan and then the lower Roaring Fork all the way to Glenwood Springs and then the Colorado River. And so as you um, can imagine, I think most of you have probably driven I-70 west to Utah. And as you drive down I-70, you reach a really unique feature in the river um, that is located at the Cameo Call. And we'll talk about what the Cameo Call means as well. This is the beginning of a 15 mile stretch of the Colorado River that's um, pretty regularly very, very low in water. Um, so the river just gets um, much um, smaller, much smaller flows in this reach until it gets to Grand Junction. Um, and so right there at the Cameo Call, this is the really unique feature on the river that can show you where you are when you see the Cameo Call. This is the um, um, diversion structure, the roller dam is what you may hear it called as. It's a very unique dam um, that diverts water into canals that serve um, the irrigated um, lands and the water for the people in the Grand Junction area. And so lots of water comes off the river at the beginning of this 15 mile reach. And then some water rejoins the river or a significant portion of it rejoins the river from the Gunnison River, which happens in Grand Junction, um, hence the name the Grand Junction. So the Gunnison River is the end of the 15 mile reach. And there we go, seeing that um, nice confluence picture there. And so another important, important piece of what happens in the 15 mile reach is to know that that's the stretch of the river that's going through Fruta and Clifton and areas that are really important to agriculture in our state. So those um, diversions that come off of the Colorado River are not only feeding a really large population, but are feeding an area of irrigated agriculture that I certainly love. Um, I love Palisade or I love Palisade peaches. And that's an image that we see here of these peach orchards and wine and vineyards that are grown there using water from the Colorado River. Another important thing um, to understand as we talk tonight is, is about water rights. And um, you know, there is a very wide array of what people understand about water rights. Um, and so just to make sure that we have very simple basics while we talk about this. Um, well, I will say that if you know that this saying from Mark Twain, that that whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting over, that is um, probably enough to know about, the, about Colorado's water rights. That's probably where everybody starts. Um, but in Colorado, water um, is a pro is a property of the public, and it's and it's for the use of the people, but it's subject to appropriation. And so, everyone has the right to appropriate the already unappropriated or the remaining unappropriated waters of the state, um, and they it needs to be done for a beneficial use in order of priority. And so, those three things that it's appropriated it's for beneficial use and it's in order of priority. Those are the important pieces of this. It has, water has been used and moved around the state of Colorado and really around the West for hundreds of years as settlers got here. You can see this picture from Harper's Bazaar from 1874. Um, those men are lifting a, a gate in order to allow water onto their fields from the, um, from the Colorado River. And so because we're going to be talking about this and because it's important to understand about why we even have Rudai Reservoir, I'm going to take us through what prior appropriation means. Um, so 
as I was mentioning, um, in the history of Colorado, you may have the developed land here, you know, settled upon land here and determined that you didn't have enough water to grow the types of fields that you or the crops that you might have been growing. And so if you had established your desire to the water, your beneficial use of the water, let's say in this example in 1910, then you have you're essentially considered a senior user. You're you have a 1910 water right. Um, if someone 60 years later still wanted to make use of water and there was still water available in the river, they could also get a water right to divert water off of the river for their needs. And so that would be the 1970 water right. And all of these water rights are in association with each other, right? So the 1970 water right is upstream of the 1910 water right. In years of dry conditions where there's not enough water to go around, which we have seen plenty of in the last 20 years, then there is an order of that of who receives that water. And the this is where the term first in um, time, first in right comes from. That's the other very important Colorado water phrase um, that you might get familiar with. But those who made claim to the water first receive the water when in, they're in short supply. And so in this situation, the 1970 water right holder um, would be called out. And so they would no longer be allowed to divert water off of the river until that person, that water rights holder from 1910 was satisfied. And so that's that's how the water system works in a very best, basic way in Colorado. And that's um, important to how Root Eye Reservoir was built or why Root Eye Reservoir was built. So we'll talk a minute about Root Eye, um, the reservoir. Um, uh, thanks, Christina, for showing where it is. But what's important about it is it was built because of the Frying Pan Arkansas Project. And so, again, this is the Frying Pan. The Arkansas is on the other side of the Continental Divide. And the Frying Pan Arkansas Project diverts water from the upper Frying Pan River into the Arkansas River to make use for, um, it makes use of that water on the Eastern Slope, mostly for Colorado Springs and Aurora. Um, and so it's done through these very large diversion tunnels that are located through the middle of the Continental Divide. You can see them, um, the, um, see them depicted here. And going back to that idea of water rights, when they built this project, and I think I can go forward a slide so you can see a little bit of the history of the project. The Root Eye Reservoir is what's called compensatory storage for the West Slope. So those water rights near Cameo and in the Grand, um, Grand Valley of Colorado near Grand Junction, they're very, very senior water rights. And the Fry Arc project was built much later than those water rights were. Most of those water rights in the Grand Junction area are from the early 1900s. And the Frying Pan Arkansas project was built in the 1960s. And you can see there it was um, approved by President Kennedy. And so it is a junior water right. And um, they built the reservoir because they knew they would be taking water off of the top of the Frying Pan River and that that may in dry years not allow enough water to satisfy those senior water rights holders that were down in the Grand um, Grand Valley area. And so they built Root Eye Reservoir to store water um, at the same time that they're diverting water off the top of the watershed. And that water is stored in Root Eye. And then those users in the Grand Valley area can call for that water when needed. It also continues to provide um, water in the rivers in the Western area, in the Western Slope. And so Root Eye Reservoir, to get back to the basics of it, um, it was, began operation, so it was filled in 1968, and that's when it began operation. And then some statistics for it, it's, a, it's about 102,000 acre feet is what it holds on a regular basis. Um, there is about 56,000 acre feet on average diverted to the Arkansas Valley. Um, through a tunnel called the Boosted Tunnel. There are lots of tunnels. The Boosted Tunnel is the largest of them, and it can carry up to 950 CFS. Um, I have in another slideshow a picture of, you know, you can essentially drive a truck through these tunnels. If, in, if you don't have an idea of how large 950 CFS is, it's enormous, and you can drive trucks through the tunnels this size. 
Um, the Bureau of Reclamation owns the water in Rudai Reservoir and the dam. Let me go back a picture so you can see that dam again. So there's the dam there um, at the downstream end of Rudai Reservoir. And this is the frying pan coming off of that. So the Bureau of Reclamation owns that dam and owns the water within it. And then they manage how it fills. They also manage how those diversions occur in the frying pan Arkansas project. The goal of the Bureau of Reclamation is to try to fill Rudai Reservoir every year by July, by the 4th of July, essentially. And they try to do that during that time frame because that's when um, water is melting in the upper frying pan. That's when all of our snow is melting. And then they hold the water there for recreational purposes, but also to release it as those um, down valley users, water rights users with senior water rights, they release it for them um, to make use for their beneficial uses. And those releases are agreed upon ahead of time through contracts. And so we'll talk about the water that's contracted out of Rudai Reservoir. And then what we're here to talk about tonight is the use of that water for the endangered fish. And so Dave is going to talk about that. And then other important numbers just to remember as we talk today is that um, there is a, a minimum stream flow that the Bureau of Reclamation must maintain in the Frying Pan River in the winter. That minimum stream flow is about 40 CFS, so it's 39 CFS. So they always have to release water out of the reservoir in order to meet that goal. And then they also have to maintain 110 CFS in the summertime. Okay, so we know that creating reservoirs causes, um, like we create, we do man-made things, we create things in order to solve problems, and there's um, there's obviously ramifications for every solution that we have. And so while they were trying to solve problems by building Rudai Reservoir, we also recognized that um, there were some opportunities created in the way that they solved those problems. And so one of the big opportunities that was created is the ability to, to produce hydropower. Um, there's a hydropower plant at the bottom of the dam at Rudai Reservoir, and it generates um, power for the city of Aspen. So that's their one of that's uh, about 20% of their clean energy portfolio. And um, the other, um, well, I was I'll talk about these contracts real quick. So this is the fish water. This is what we're going to be Dave's going to be talking about a lot. There's about 10,000 acre feet of fish dedicated water in Rudai Reservoir every year. Um, for the endangered fish. And then about 40,000 or 41,000 acre feet of that 102,000 acre feet that I mentioned is contracted to water rights holders downstream of Rudai Reservoir. And then there's what's called reservoir water. And so we have about 50,000 acre feet um, for recreation and to maintain a, a surface level throughout Rudai Reservoir through the winter. So some other opportunities that that created was that um, it essentially created a tailwater fishery in the frying pan river. And I imagine many of you enjoy the, the fish in the frying pan and hopefully you've um, gotten to experience what it might be like to catch these enormous trout um, that I have pictures of here. But this is a really big industry for the basalt area. I believe that the last time the Conservancy looked into that economic driver, it was about a $4 million industry for water recreation on the frying pan and in Rudai Reservoir um, for our area. So that's both still water recreation and fishing. And then um, because it's winter now, I just want to say that we, we also see a lot of winter recreation on Rudai Reservoir. And because I steal most of my pictures. This one's actually an original. Those are my two cute kids getting to ice skate on the reservoir. So we also know that there's problems created. And so one of the main problems that we see or, or the major problems that we see because of the existence of Rudai Reservoir is that we've now taken a free flowing river and blocked it and made releases out of it. So we're making unnatural releases out of that. That changes the hydrograph, which affects all of the ecological services of a river. Um, so we have, an, we have an unnatural hydrograph. It should slowly, let's see if you can see what my, it should be down around the winter time when there, we're just looking at base flows. And then it should rise steeply in the spring as temperatures increase and we get longer days. Um, 
we should see a more natural hydrograph where it starts melting in April and May and begins to peak in June. And then the river typically falls sharply off in um, late June or July in this area and goes back down um, through October to another base flow where it starts snowing again. Um, this is a very unnatural hydrograph, right? We're seeing lots of peaks and jumps and there's not responding to snow melt or to rainfall. This is responding to the way we're, that we're releasing water out of Rudi Reservoir to meet all of those needs that I mentioned before. So it's an unnatural hydrograph. It's at, for the most part, it's an unpredictable hydrograph. Um, and so we aren't, um, we can't foresee how this hydrograph might play out um, in any given year. And it's hard enough to foresee a hydrograph for a, a river when you're looking at just weather patterns and accumulated snowpack. It's um, even harder when you don't know how um, an irrigator in Palisade may call for water or how low the river may be or how high the river may be um, based on storm events that are occurring and meeting the needs of those downstream water rights holders. And then the other problem that we have is that our our closest communities to Rudai Reservoir have very little control. So like I was saying, the Bureau of Reclamation controls controls the reservoir in response to those that have contract water within the reservoir. And while our communities have very little amounts of water in the reservoir, most of that water is controlled outside of the Roaring Fork Basin. And so that's where I come in. That's where Rudai Water and Power comes in. We, we serve as a voice for these communities. Um, and we, um, you know, we, we are working with partners like Dave to try to meet all of the needs of Rudai Reservoir um, and trying to have as little impact or as much positive impact in, in the way that we make those releases happen as possible. April, yep. it's Christina. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Uh, we, no, have a question. we have a question from Scott. Uh, there's a chance you might be getting to this or David might be getting to it, but I just wanted to let you know what the question was. Um, his question is, how is priority given to the three different buckets of water in Rudai? Um, thanks. I'm assuming that's probably Scott Schreiber. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Yes. Um, so the there is the priority of the fish water, which is a separate pool. And then in the contract water, Scott, um, are essentially three different priority buckets based on when those contracts were sold. So there's first round contracts, second round contracts, and third round contracts. And so those are, the way that I understand it, those are the priorities. But essentially, if Rudai Reservoir is short, so it's a little different than a, um, a call of the river. If Rudai is short one year, if it doesn't fill, then all contract water rights holders take the same percentage of cut off the top. And so instead of it happening in different timing, it just happens in how much water is available to that contract water rights holder. Everybody takes the cut, the same cut. Email me if you want more information. <laughs> okay. And um, I believe that um, this is where I was going to turn it over to you, Dave, and then we'll come back to this crazy puzzle that I have on the screen um, once, once you wrap up. And I just need about five more minutes to get through my slides after you finish, Dave. Okay. Uh, Dave, I can't hear you. It doesn't I, look as though you're muted. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. I'm glad you left me with this slide. Um, because <laughs> I didn't want to put this into mine, but I did notice it in my material for, you know, frying pan matters. Um, and uh, this is a really interesting one because it, it, this is really about the frying pan ecosystem, and um, it speaks to a little bit about the complexity of managing biota, as particularly within a scrambled hydrology. So um, anyway, let me share my screen, and I'll go through a bunch of stuff here. Um, and hopefully, can you all see that pretty well? I, I'm having trouble kind of seeing different parts of my screen at the same time, so hopefully that's... My Dave, screen. I don't see your screen yet. You don't? Mm -mm. Okay, try that again. Screen two. It doesn't look like you're sharing anything yet. There we go. It's coming up. Hooray. Okay. 
Yeah, you're good. There's too many things on my screen. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here. I'm sorry we couldn't join you in person up in Basalt. I really enjoy driving in the snow and being in the snow. I don't like it with all the other people, particularly on the road. So um, I think it was the same call. And hopefully, if you have any questions after we blow through all this content, please feel free to contact me or April or Christina, and we'll try to get you all the information that you need. Um, again, my name is David Graff. I've been working with the recovery program um, for a couple of years now. I'm just, I think I know sort of how our biannual annual cycles work. Um, let me go to the next one here. Uh, and I want to give you a rundown again, what the, who the fish are, introduce you to the fish in the recovery program um, and what our real purpose is and how we got to where we are. And then I'm going to uh, give a little bit more background on the Western water law, because I really think it's important to understand how what you're seeing out in the rivers and streams is not necessarily um, a natural flow. It's often managed and it's often managed according to Western water law and how all these buckets and and pipes a little bit backdrop on that. Um, and then we're going to zero in on recovery program flow management because that's really what I get to do. Uh, it's I have the opportunity, in particular in the Colorado Basin, to well, not literally get my hands on the water, but I, I'm responsible for delivering um, water to meet critical needs for rare fish. So um, that's a that's a great purpose. Um, and then I'll get to the question and answer and, and tip you off as to what we're working on in the 15 mile reach, there's kind of a big project um, in our very, very near future. So I wanted to just let you know what we're up to there. Um, so they're listed fish. There are four federally listed fish, two of these, the Colorado pike minnow and um, the, let's see, I think it was the, well, the humpback chub is when there, as soon as there was an endangered species act, these, Fish were actually recognized as rare and imperiled before there was an Endangered Species Act, so they immediately went on the list back in 1973 when the act was first established. Uh, the four from clockwise left around are uh, the Colorado pike minnow, which you know, historically grew up to you know five feet long, 60, 70, 80 pounds. There's some incredibly anecdotal stories of a hundred pound, seven foot long fish, and we're kind of debunking some of that, uh, but we have you know had these captured up to four feet long and 40 pounds. So it's a pretty incredible top tier predator in the Colorado system evolved over a couple of three to 5 million years. All of these fish kind of evolved in this basin and nowhere else on earth. Um, the second one to the right is the razorback sucker. Um, we thought that the razorback and the bony tail were in fact extinct. They were functionally extirpated. They really couldn't find them in the environment in any sort of consistent sort of way. So when they started to find these things back in the 80s and 90s, they literally caught them and put them in hatcheries immediately. So both the razorbacks and the bony tail, which is another hub um, or chub species, those were put into hatcheries to raise brood stock. So we really didn't lose the species entirely. Um, the one there on the lower right is the humpback chub. That one's sort of more of a, a canyon um, species. It doesn't roam around quite so much as the pike minnow and the razorback. Um, but it's also a, a neat little omnivore. It'll pretty, it'll bite a fly. It'll eat algae off the bottom of the, the um, wall in a canyon and, and try to make its habitat that or forage that way. The bony tail is the one we probably know the least amount. We do release a lot of them from um, broodstock, from hatcheries, uh, but it, it doesn't really show up back in surveys very easily. And we have a hard time finding them. I, there's, again, that's the one that we don't know as much about as we do about the other three, but they still are caught in the wild and they do show up. And, and the more and more we put in um, arrays and, and ways to radio tag these things where there's a little transmitter that goes across some kind of an antenna receiver, we're starting to pick up more and more information about the bony tail as well. So there's the four species. Um, there are Within the Endangered Species Act, there's provisions to designate critical habitat. You can see down on the lower left of that picture, there's Lake Powell in the very bottom. Um, and the San Juan is critical habitat for razorbacks and pike minnow. And the upper basin, including all the major trips of the Green River, including the Green River, are uh, critical habitat for the all four of the species um, in one place or another. 
I want to just point out, um, let me go back to this one. There's eight essentially warm water native species in the basin. There's our four listed ones, which I just mentioned. Um, and then there's three others. There's the round-tailed chub, two sucker species, the flannel mouth and the blue head sucker and one speckled day. So these eight make up the full assemblage of sort of warm water native species in the entire upper Colorado basin above Lake Powell. Um, I just have to point out that those are our native species in the middle of that circle and all the rest of those species are non-native species that also occupy the upper Colorado basin. And this is just sort of a, a background for what we're trying to manage against. Again, I, I manage flows. Um, we have a, a non-native fish manager who, who manages uh, really to, to work against the non-native fish. The big three that we're really working on who are predatory are the smallmouth bass. They're the ones in that red stripe at the bottom, the smallmouth bass, northern pike, and now there are an increasing number of walleyes that are showing up and able to live in the river system for multiple years. So um, that is certainly a concern, but it, it kind of gives you the, the basic idea that there are sort of these rare fish that are still persisting in the midst of this soup of um, non-natives that are also occupying the same habitat. So April talked a little bit about, about the hydrology, which um, emerges from Rudai Reservoir. Uh, this is a scroll from three years, the last three years of flows down at the Cameo Gauge. Um, and we'll come back to the last three year, years of flow toward, toward the end of the um, presentation. But I just wanted to touch on this because down at Cameo, down in the 15 mile reach, there still is some, this sense of native hydrology. Um, it, it does have a snowmelt hydrograph. These, these peaks that you see are all coming from spring snowmelt driven peaks. That's a natural flow. What that does is really scour out the cobbles in the backwaters. It, it creates habitat. This is a neat picture off the Yampa River um, that has cottonwood galleries and cut banks and river processes sort of occurring um, on a an nearly annual basis when you have high flow. That high flow creates the habitat, creates these optimal spawning conditions for um, the emergence of fry from the, these egg um, bags that the native fish will put into those clean cobbles, um, the fry emerge, they drift, they eddy out into backwaters or other productive habitats. Um, hopefully they get through to be young of year and become juveniles if there's enough habitat and grow out and recruit into the population. So um, you need to have intact river processes and sequencing from you know multiple years in a row to get from um, this fry emergence to young a year to juvenile habitats. You have to evade all those predators. You have to grow. Um, some of these don't sexually mature for five to seven years. A pike minnow, I think it's about six or seven years before it can re reproduce at all. Um, so that's a long time as it's growing, as it's a youth to avoid being eaten by a pike or a smallmouth bass. So again, that's, that's still a lot of the problem we're having is trying to work through all the non-native stuff. For the 15 mile reach, um, there's this cool little published um, document the Fish and Wildlife published back in, I think, 1995, or no, March of 2000. Um, it talks about the 15 mile reach and how it's got this unique geomorphology. It's kind of blasting out of Tibet Canyon where it's just confined and into this open alluvial valley. So there's a complexity of habitats. It's also pretty warm down here. Um, being in Loma, I know how warm it gets in the summertime, so it's highly productive. It, it allows fish to grow uh, pretty fast in that kind of habitat, and, and given its sort of canyon mouth alluvial environment, it's very diverse. And um, all of those habitats are created by flow, so that's where, um, again, flow is really, really important uh, to the 15 mile reach. Uh, before we get down into the details of the flow, though, I did want to give you some background on the recovery program, what we do, uh, and how the, the program works. We Dave, have, uh, David? Yes, Christina. Yep. Quick, we have a quick question from Lonnie. Uh, she's, oh, asking, sure. she's asking, generally, how do the non-native species arrive here? Great question. Yeah, they um, emerge, well, they... <laughs> Apparently, carp were unloaded off of freight trains as a food source uh, for people working along the rail lines, you know, well over 100 years ago. Um, 
Things like walleye and bass and northern pike were stocked largely by game and fish agencies within the three states that, that we work with in the upper basin. Um, there wasn't really such thing as listed imperiled fish. So those fish weren't screened in the reservoirs. They were largely thought to be, you know, Eastern flatwater species. So there was less concern that they would thrive in the river systems or less care that they would. They, again, years ago, they were banking um, suckers as trash fish. Um, so th that that's really the inception of them. Forage fish, there's still a little bit of a bucket brigade here and there. Um, you know, people want to stock their ponds along their, in their farm, farm fields. Uh, there's a lot of, we're doing much better in terms of um, just getting the message out that um, moving fish around is literally, it's illegal in all the states that we work with, uh, but it's also not really good um, ecosystem practice. Uh, so we're, that's the general, the general answer. Did that help, Lonnie? Yeah, thanks a lot. You bet. Um, so we do, we have a, a sister program down in San Juan. Um, we share some resources, we share information and data and our outreach um, people. Um, but our upper Colorado program, it's a little bit different in terms of the complexity of water management and our partnerships a little bit different. It started um, really to address lots of the upper place and problems in Colorado. Um, there was real impetus and I'll get to that in a second. So the real impetus was that under the Endangered Species Act, any water project um, which instituted a new depletion um, in any Trans Mountain project, any new pond, any new water user or industrial user uh, doing a project would most likely have some sort of a water, water depletion because there might've been a federal permit that created a nexus to a federal action. The federal action would, um, or the, uh, the prime agency would consult with the Fish and Wildlife Service who has sort of jurisdiction over the, these rare and listed species. And they would say, oh, well, that's a hundred acre foot of depletion on your project that constitute an injury. So there was a real bottleneck. Uh, there was no way to recover, to provide enough offsetting water to um, offset the depletions that were being introduced. So this program uh, really emerged out of a bottleneck between permitting under the Endangered Species Act, Section 7, this compliance for water users and water providers, um, while at the same time keeping uh, the listed fish, you know, but more or less happy, um, keeping them from going uh, more extinct or less, uh, more imperiled. That's I'm not wording that very well. However, um, the idea was to leverage the resources for all the water users come together and sort of let's recover the fish. That is the ultimate idea. If we can recover the fish, you can continue with your water diversions. We're going to all work as partners to get this done. So partners emerged in the late 80s. It was contingent upon the continued implementation of the upper basin recovery program, which really is about funding mechanisms, implementing all these different actions. I've got a couple pictures of major water diversions here in the Grand Valley, all of which have undergone significant um, revisions to uh, and to their infrastructure to make things work for the fish. Um, and right now we're in a reauthorization period. The project, the program did have a sunset in 2023. Um, we've got that extended to 2024. And now we're working on funding through 2031, I believe was the next date. Um, this is our program elements, our in-stream flow. So we have coordinators for each of these different elements. I'm the flow program manager. We have a habitat coordinator, a non-native fish coordinator, um, which is actually a job that is out there to be hired shortly. Uh, we have an outreach coordinator, a propagation and genetics coordinator. And we have research and monitoring, which is conducted largely by our, some of our partners. Um, and then we have program and management. And we have you know, data management within our program as well. Uh, our partners include the states of Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah. Of course, the Bureau of Reclamation, we work with very closely in water users in Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming. Power interest, um, Western Area Power Association or Administration, WAPA, as well as the Colorado River Energy Distributors Association, their consortium of all the small rural cooperatives. 
Um, and they have very strong representation with the partnership. We have two NGOs, Western River Advocates and the Nature Conservancy, um, as well as the National Park Service. And we're also partners with our own agency, the Fish and Wildlife Service. So that was a lot to swallow for the program. Um, is, are there any program questions? I wanted to, again, dive into water law for about five minutes, hopefully, and then we'll go into the I don't see any questions, David. Cool, thank you. All right, so Western water law is really, um, it's kind of the backdrop for everything that we do. Uh, going way back, again, historical perspective, thousand years ago, the ancestral floodlands were irrigating um, before Colorado was a state, um, before the United States was a country, the Spanish had settled in the southern part of the um, country it's out west and they developed this these acequias which were really you know mutual ditches um, based on equitability and community cooperation and in California in the gold rush period this mining became a real like driver to really get organized on water law there were so many miners going out there and starting to use hydraulic cannons and uh, taking as much of the water off the landscape as possible to, to blow the hillsides apart to sluice gold through over ever growing sizes of sluice boxes. Um, so they ended up really, as April was pointing out, this idea of first come, first serve, um, or first in time, first in right, became the underlying principle for Western water law. First in taps for administration and putting laws in place were in, in Colorado anyway, where in 1869 under territorial rule for the statehood in 1976. The federal um, government was initiating and incentivizing a bunch of Western micro expansion, lots of which required agricultural and irrigated land. Um, again, a litany of acts, the Homestead Act, the Mining Act, Desert Lands Act, and um, in the 1860s, 70s during Reconstruction, um, the U.S. Forest Service came about in the late late 1890s and early 1900s, the Forest Service Organic Act in 1905, I think, um, really started to talk very specifically about timber management and favorable conditions of flow. So um, the US government got involved with water in kind of an indirect way. It's always been a, a little bit of a tension between the federal government and state governments about who manages and allocates water resources. But the Forest Service has always been had this provision for providing favorable conditions of flow to downstream users um, off the forest. In addition, at that same time, the Native American treaties were coming about um, with this concept of reserved water rights embedded in there that has huge implications for Colorado River water management in the future. Um, and the Reclamation Act of 1902 really recognized this idea that we, in order to um, facilitate westward expansion, uh, we, at the federal level, really needed to be more involved. In fact, um, I think two of the earliest projects in Reclamation's portfolio were the Gunnison Tunnel, um, the diverted water into the Uncompahgre Valley out of the Gunnison, um, and then the Grand Valley Project was initiated uh, in the early 1900s, and they began construction of the Grand Valley Project, i.e. The, the Cameo Roller Dam, in about 1912. In 1956, um, there was explicit um, <clears throat> recognition that the states are in charge of their own water allocation, again, subject to interstate compacts and all the rest, um, water decrees. So these three doctrines really have emerged. We're only real in Colorado in the upper basin talking about prior appropriations, as April mentioned. Riparian rights is a Eastern doctrine. You live on a stream and don't material injure or change the water. You can use the water, put it back in the river. Um, no harm, no foul, sort of. But prior appropriations is a different deal. First in time, first in right. You don't, so long as it's for beneficial use, you don't have to put it back in the river anywhere. Um, Northern California and Washington and Oregon have sort of hybrid versions because they have um, very different conditions on the western part of their states than they do in the eastern part of their states. David, one more question yes. for you. Sure. Um, another question from Lonnie. 
Do you find yourself at occasional odds on fish recovery with agencies more concerned with satisfying human consumptive use? And if you want to wait to the end to answer that, we can do that too. Yeah, let's come back down a little bit. Sorry, Lonnie, we'll get we'll get to the because the consumption. Um I, I you know, our partnership, as I mentioned, the recovery program really is a partnership. Um, I work and employed by the Fish and Wildlife Service, but I work for those partners that I listed at the right of that other slide. We have to all come together. We we think as sort of a, a block um, and the service actually uh, comes in later and um, basically gives us blessing for what we're doing um, in the form of a sufficient progress memo that says, yep, keep doing what you're doing or here's a redirect to something different. So, um, Okay, and, good, David, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, we can come back to that too in the Q and A session because it is it's um, it's a tricky one for sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, here's a, a repeat of what April had said about Colorado being a prior approach for each state, and there's opportunities for the public to um, reap the benefits of a free condition or put water to beneficial uses. This right shall never be de denied but it is subject to the caveat being that it's subject to prior appropriations. Um, so that's, there's sort of a, a chicken and egg thing. There's the opportunity, but then there's the caveat and then there's the priority system, which sort of manages and over, oversees the whole thing, which is administered by your state engineers and the division engineers that work for them. In Colorado, we have, we're a headwater state, 18 other states. Um, there's allocations from those states be between states in the form of compacts and a couple Supreme Court decrees that also governs water allocations between Colorado and adjacent states. The law of the river, if you've heard that term, that is referring literally to the 1922 River Basin Compact. Um, these asterisks are these interim guidelines established in 2006, which we've been operating under for nearly 20 years. And the big deal that you've been reading about in the paper a lot is the post-2026 operating guidelines, which are um, to be de determined. The federal environmental statutes that really kind of brought us to where we are now in terms of environmental use of water of this circle the Endangered Species Act, because that's where I am. It's again, a Litany Wilderness Act, the National Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, NEPA, the Clean Water Act, including section, section 404 with waters of the U.S. Like Bowman, um, Endangered Species Act, Federal Land Policy and Management Act was a BLM Procedural Act, um, and then the Farm Bill and Reauthorizations. All this stuff touches on water and water management. Federal authorities, um, so it triggers lots of permitting. And again, you get in this federal nexus with injury when you have a water depletion and how are you going to cover the water depletion? Well, that's what our program does in the, in the Colorado Basin. In Colorado, there's a couple um, important statutes regarding water. One is the Colorado's in-stream flow program, which was established in 1973. Frying pan does have in-stream flows as well as those um, operational requirements from the reclamation. Um, it has the 39 and the 110 CFS as in-stream flows that were appropriated. You know, I didn't catch a date, maybe 1977, something like that, pretty long ago, um, right? Nearly the beginning of the act. There's been a bunch of amendments to the In-Stream Flow Act um, to allow for flexibility, including leasing water, um, improving the conditions so it doesn't have to be the minimum um, preservation level. So there's a lot of flexibility and the, the legislature does a really good job sort of keeping up and paying attention to the In-Stream Flow Act and, and making sure that it's doing what um, the different stakeholders are hoping it will. In 2006, the um, Colorado legislature passed this recreational and channel diversion um, allowance. So as a community, I think there's one in Basalt. Um, I think there's one in Carbondale. And I think there's one in Glenwood. Um, RICDs have been appropriated to the extent they've been perfected under Colorado water law. I'm not sure at this point. Um, however, it gives local intergovernmental authority authorities the right to appropriate water to keep water in the river. Um, and largely the RICD statute recognized the economic benefits of high flows um, and big water. So to the extent that um, ecological purposes, 
you know, we're big fans of our ICDs in terms of keeping water in rivers at appropriate times. So um, this is another, another tool, I guess I put these all in the toolbox. So um, now I wanna go out of the history and into the present. This is 2023. Um, and I, before I talk a little bit about our program water management, there's a couple terms I need to define um, being one programmatic biological opinion. Um, the programmatic biological opinion, if you went to the Fish and Wildlife Service and asked for a permit or some authorization that they had the jurisdiction to weigh in on, you were going to impact um, an endangered species or a you know, threatened species, you would get a biological opinion, which states the Fish and Wildlife Service's opinion on you know, mitigation, how your project is going to impact that particular species. Um, again, going back to that, my earlier history part, in the 70s and early 80s, every, every acre foot of water was injury. So you had to mitigate and it was um, a very piecemeal approach to dealing with a pretty major problem. So a programmatic biological opinion, it bundles up all the depletions and the adverse impacts of, of all these separate actions, bundles them up and um, provides one opinion Again, in the case of the 15 mile reach PBO, um, the opinion was that, okay, these depletions will have an impact, but on the flip side, if you implement the program with all these partners and you get some water and you, you know, um, manage the habitat and manage non-native fish and propagate some fish and coordinate all these things, that is your offsetting program. So again, that programmatic approach really allows us at the program level to leverage everybody's resources, sort of toward this common goal of recovering the species. So that's, that's how a programmatic biological opinion works relative to a singular bi biological opinion, which you might have on a, a single project. Uh, the overview of the 15 mile reach back in you know, the mid nineties was there were hundreds of water projects ongoing, um, hundreds of consultations. So that it really became a matter of scale. We can bundle all those consultations that the service is doing and just put them into a programmatic bin and have all you guys take care of you guys being the program and the staff take care of like managing for the fish, then we think this can, can work. Um, so things like reauthorization of the Frying Pan Arkansas project, the Colorado Big Thompson project, the Grand Valley project, they have authorizations that come up for review every so often. They all got all the existing projects, all the existing depletions got bundled in there. That was a tune of about 100, 1 million acre feet of uh, depletions at that time in 2000. Then it author also authorized up to 120,000 acre foot of new water depletions um, to be determined over the lifetime of the, the programmatic biological opinion. So in a bundle, we, we call it the 15 mile reach PBO. The 15 mile reach PBO um, does have these provisions to, you know, it covers all these projects, it covers up to 120,000 acre feet of new potential new depletions. Um, but you do have to do these things. The flow needs have to be partially satisfied through these coordinated reservoir operations, i.e. these allocated storage pools. We meet with this historic user pool um, group every single week during the summertime to manage the historic user pool. And just as a quick sidebar, the historic user pool out of Green Mountain Reservoir was kind of was set up as a similar analog to Rudai Reservoir. April talked about how it was compensatory storage. Um, Rudai was, was storage for Western Slope water purposes in compensation for all the upstream depletions that were coming out of the Boosted Tunnel and into the Twin Lakes and the Arkansas side. Um, likewise, HUP or historic user pool water, that's all the upper Colorado stuff. It's stored in Green Mountain Reservoir and offsets uh, largely Windy Gap depletions and Dillon Reservoir Moffat collection for Denver water and Northern water. So that's Menzies compensatory storage for the Western Slope and we had the recovery program and tapped into that. This is a big overview of all the different buckets we use. Jason White, I'm gonna focus in on the Colorado River Reservoirs. Um, again, there's Rudai Reservoir down kind of toward the lower right, a couple other uh, bundle of reservoirs at the top we work with. There's Green Mountain Reservoir. Um, Williams Fork is, is one of the Denver compensatory buckets that they use and they'll deliver some water from there and we can exchange water to the bear under certain conditions. Um, Lake Granby is our main um, upper basin account, as well as Wolford Reservoir, operated by the River District. 
Um, and then Windy Gap is really a pumping facility that gives a little bit of operational flexibility. There's Shoshone right there in the middle of Glenwood Canyon. Heard a lot about that lately. Um, and then down there at the very bottom, the Cameo Fall or Cameo Reach, and we'll dive into that. And right below there's the 15 mile reach. And I, I did put a nod to the 18 mile reach as well. Um, below the Gunnison before it exits the valley and goes back into another canyon. That's more of the same similar productive habitat um, that we're really going to dive into in the next five years to take a, a little closer look at what sort of benefits it provides for the fisheries. This is a schematic of the Cameo diversion. There's the roller dam on the right side of there, the big canal, there's a um, flume, the dotted thing goes underneath the river to provide water over to the Orchard Mesa on the south side of the river. Um, so again, th this picture looks pretty simple, but there's a whole lot going on here. Um, that lower, the Grand Valley Canal right there literally is the lowest big canal in the valley, and that is the official head of the 15 mile reach. The things that I wanted to point to uh, the two paths at the bottom of the picture, one of them is a straight up um, hydro plant that was just upgraded. It's called the Vinelands Power Plant now um, at Orchard Mesa. So that was one of the purposes of the Grand Valley Project. Um, and then there's also a pumping plant there that allows the Orchard Mesa to pump um, basically three parts of water up on top of the Mesa for irrigating a bunch of orchards and vineyards up there. Um, and one part of that pump is a hydraulic uh, lift basically that comes back down. There are actually three parts goes back into the river. One part goes up on top of the mesa. So a whole bunch of water comes back into the river right there at the top of the 15 mile ridge. You can see there's that check structure and a checked water um, nomenclature there that allows uh, some gates to come down, the water to be checked back up above the Grand Valley diversion. Um, so it can literally again, not ever see the head of, of the 15 mile reach go right into the Grand Valley Canal. So we have to do everything we can to keep water from either the power plants or coming through some of these other structures to get into the head of the 15 mile reach. Otherwise, that's 15 miles, basically dewatered river. Um, since the program's gone in, we've done some things, those red things are fish screens and fish passages that we put in the canals and in the rivers to allow fish that get caught in canals to return to the river and the fish that are trying to get upstream for migratory purposes, they have some way to get upstream um, past big diversions in the middle of the river. I'm sorry, this is going pretty fast, but uh, there's a lot, to, there's a lot of stuff right there. Um, this is a just a pie graph of where our water comes from. And this is 2023. Five of those seven sources in the pie are coming out of Root Eye Reservoir. Um, and there's the numbers over there on the right side. We'll get into that a little bit more, but there was a little bit over 30,000 acre feet of water available in 2023. Um, and that's direct program sources that we used for the 15 mile reach. In uh, Rude Eye Reservoir, 18,637 and a half. Granby, the 5412 water comes out of there. And Wolford, we had a full supply of 6,000 acre feet last year. Um, and that little graph on the right, I just wanted to point to the HUP surplus water, which is that big green mountain chunk there. Um, on a year when, when there is surplus, that surplus water in compensatory storage in Green Mountain is really for Grand Valley irrigators if they need it. There comes a time in a, in a good year like last year when you know, weekly, one of the discussions we have is like, what's the condition of the surplus? Are we going to have, are we going to need all that surplus to meet irrigation needs in the valley? Well, last year, um, when there's a surplus declaration, it's basically saying, we don't need all that extra water stored there. So you at the recovery program can now operate some of that water. So last year, compared to our program sources, we had 30,000 acre feet of water from the program we were able to tap into an almost another 47,000 acre feet of water from that HEP surplus. So it hugely, in 2023, it hugely benefited the 15 mile reach, which we did not have access to that water in 2021 and 2022. So trying to give you some order of magnitude sorts of comparisons. So what we do in a typical water year, we look at the snow water equivalent in the upper basin to start to grow. This is all the 23, the water, um, equivalent in 
above Lake Powell, they have plots like this for um, you know the, pretty much every stream gauge in the upper basin. You can you can get an evolution plot like how's your how's my snow water equivalent doing? And you can see in one case here in early April, the black line really marks a sort of a historic 30 year high for snow water equivalent as of you know near the end of April last year. Um, so really good snow conditions last year going into the runoff season. In the runoff season, we start to look and say, okay, what, what type of water year? We set low targets for the 15 mile reach based on what sort of hydrologic year type we have. So it's roughly stratified into four kind of uneven clumps that lower 20 and the middle 30% is the lower half. And then the wet stuff is toward the green and blue to the right side of that plot. And those tran translate directly into our monthly flow targets that were established back in the PBO, which is what as the flow manager, I'm trying to hit with the water supplies that I have. So we have peak flow targets um, to hit, you know, um, we try to hit 23.5 on a, which was last year, um, on an average wet year, that was that second quadrant of, of flows, we try to hit 21,750 CFS, um, peak in 2023 was 16,900 CFS. So, you know, we didn't hit the peak peak, but um, we had a big, long period of time, you know, right in here, there was six, over 16,000 CFS and over 10,000 for a good 40 days last year. So overall, we were much improved over where we had been in 21 and 22. So that felt pretty good. Um, always would like to go a little bit higher, but we can't always do that. There was flooding down in Loma. The Gunnison River was running pretty wild because the North Fork and the Uncle Padre were running big. Um, so we don't have all the control that we think we want. Um, and sometimes that's a good thing for rivers. Uh, there's this note here about no coordinated reservoir operations. That's a way that we and work with um, reservoir operators in the upper basin to pass flows to increase the peak. So this is just a quick look at the history of using these cross operations to enhance peaks. All those little asterisks are years that we were able to work with the, with reservoir operators in a coordinated way. They would store, they would bypass water that could have been otherwise stored in their reservoirs to enhance the peak at specific times. And and there was just too much water. And it was coming off in a sort of a strange, unpredictable way, um, mostly really related to eastern slope um, precipitation last spring. So we were not able to do these coordinated operations last year. Could have maybe put a little few thousand CFS more on the peak, but um, all in all, it was a, a refreshing year for runoff compared. Um, that said, this is what happened later in the summer. Again, our our Average wet and our wet year targets are up there at 1,630 CFS. And this is the scroll from basically August through the end of October. Uh, we were really struggling to meet the average dry target. Um, we were able to stay above our dry year target of 810 CFS pretty much throughout the summer. So that felt good relative to some of the other years, but still a little unsatisfying when you really like, wow, we're in a yet year, wet year. Shouldn't I be up around 1,600? Um, there literally is just not enough water to maintain those sorts of flows in the 15 mile reach during the irrigation season. This is, um, again, our report card for last year. Um, considering our targets should have been in the wet or the, at least the average wet year, you know, we didn't really do that great meeting these monthly flow targets. Um, the 2023 flows are over, over there on the left and red means we didn't meet or didn't quite meet we did meet the target and we met all the dry year targets. We met most of the average dry targets, but at that wet end, even with wet hydrology, we're just not able to quite um, meet the targets that were set back in 2000. A couple, this is a um, plot, a couple plots just to get you warmed up for the next one. Uh, the one on the left is sort of the flows with or without the augmentation sources that we have. So. Um, the blue line is, is what the actual flow was. The red line is what the flow would have been if we didn't have that recovery program water um, added into the, the source water to the 15 mile reach. So as, as you can see, we would have been you know, way down here in the 500 CFS. Instead, we were up toward 1,000 and quite a bit over 1,000 for, for most of the summer last year. Over here on the right, we have um, same scroll. That's the same uh, flow at the 15 mile reach. And then here's the different major sources that we have. This is the program sources in dark green. Because we don't know 
what that what's going to happen with this HEP water here um, until they declare a surplus. We were releasing a lot of the root eye water pretty early on, and I'll show you that in a second. Then we um, then when we had uh, the HUP water show up, then we had a ton more water to you know keep bumping up. So again, this is the augmentation sources, which included the HUP water plus program sources that benefited the fish. For the frying pan, um, I think the last three years to sort of look at you know what happens on a dry year. Again, take, pay attention to the the y axis here in terms of flow. In 2021, y'all know it was a pretty bad year. There was one time in the 15 mile reach that um, more or less all the flow in the 15 mile reach, kind of that late September period was coming from program releases. This is how it looked in the frying pan over here on the right side. Again, this is the frying pan flow. So this difference here is the other contract water or the odd um, squall that Tim Miller at Reclamation would pass on through these dotted lines are the amount of program release water that uh, makes up, you know, the total flow. So again, you know, in 2022, 2023, a lot of water in the frying pan, most of the water in the frying pan is coming out of program release water. Um, again, these are just the scrolls from downstream and Palisade, considering all the program water um, versus what the um, actual habitat looked like. And for the frying pan, I just wanted to take a, a quick look for the last three years because we had three different types of hydrology to see if there were any trends in a dry hydrology. You know, again, for the period that we released water from um, root eye to meet 15 mile reach flows, about half that water over those 86 days uh, was coming out of the program releases. In 2023, under the hydrology, um, we averaged 116 CFS. We released water for 80 days. We peaked water for uh, about three weeks in mid-August to early September at 200 CFS. Again, we didn't learn and the HEP water was available until the very end of um, August. So that's when we started to, we were able to back down flows coming out of the root eye system. Um, so that that's kind of how some of the statistics work out on that. Again, uh, hopefully Christina can share any of the stuff that you want. Our next steps right now, um, and this is, I think, the last slide I have, is really this 15-mile reach um, PBO review. We were asked by the service to go and talk to um, They had a very thorough PBO. You're like, well, you're, you're not quite meeting your flow targets, and we're not seeing the species really rebounding. Um, what's going on there? So they asked some pretty hard questions. Is the, is the programmatic biological opinion, are all these activities that you're doing really covering the species and offsetting um, water depletions? So it was, a, it was kind of, they're asking some hard questions. We are, um, this is the cover shot, it's from a draft I just received a couple of days ago um, to move forward on a bunch of studies on both water supply, um, geomorphology and habitat, as well as fisheries biology. So that's what we're embarking on uh, in a matter of weeks for the next five years. So that um, it's kind of going to keep me busy for a while, as long as the wells, the other stuff. So anyway, I'm sorry that there was so much stuff there. Um, but that is the overview of the program. There's the roller dam. And this picture on the right is the Palisade fish release. Uh, it's definitely, if you're ever in the Bay, in the Bay Area, in the Grand Valley around um, early May, Please look up the fish release because the Palisade High School students release about 250 razorback suckers that they have been rearing in the hatchery at the high school um, into the river. And it really is a big community party and you get to kiss a fish. So anyway, that's all I have. That's great. Hey, David, real quick. Um, I think April said she needed to go ahead and um, go back to her presentation. And while she does that, um, Chris has a question for you. Um, he, he's asking if with last year's wet year was spawning or other, or other measure more successful for all four or any of the species. That's a really good question. Um, and we don't know the answer to that. Uh, it, it, what we did know, what we did see is, um, again, you get one data point every year. 
we saw a few more larvae, pike minnow larvae in the Colorado River than we had in past years. We picked up a lot of fish using those fish passages at both the Redlands. Um, there's a, a fish ladder there as well as the cameo diversion. You know, there's a fish ladder there. We picked up a number of native fish as well as some very large pike minnow uh, moving through those facilities. Uh, and partly that's a factor of having more water in the system for a longer period of time. Doesn't necessarily indicate that we have had a great year for spawning. Um, I think spawning is generally in pretty good shape. We, we always pick up pipe minnow and razorback fry and the, the missing link seems to be the recruitment, the, the young of the year getting to a recruitment stage and getting through that juvenile to adult stage. So um, we're working on that. One thing I will add is that one of the, we haven't really done um, larval fish sampling in great depth in the 15 mile reach um, for a number of years. And that, that's for, we focused on the Green River quite a lot in the last 10 years. So we're going to pivot back to the 15 mile reach um, and look a little more closely at things like, did they spawn? Where did they spawn? Where did the fry drift to? We have one off channel project down at um, the Audubon site here in the Grand Valley where we're gonna put a, a manufactured wetland on the side that will allow kind of fish fry to drift in there. We can raise them off channel and then we can also cull them um, as they go back to the river so we can sort and make sure that we're not putting non-native fish back into the river as well. So interesting stuff that we're doing a lot in the Grand Valley in the next three to five years. So stay tuned. Thank you, David. We'll go ahead and turn it over to April now for, the, for a couple Just more the, minutes. Yeah, how much time? Um, Maybe like three, four, five minutes at, at most, please. Okay, no problem. So as you can tell from David's presentation that managing rivers, managing water is complicated and it can be complicated based on any individual goal that you have. And so the slide that I'm sharing is a study that we had performed by a consultant um, to look at, you know, all of the different possible objectives that we may have in the frying pan river. So, you know, once the river begins being managed, um, it's, it's a matter of deciding, you know, what are your goals? What are you managing it for? What now that we're turning all the levers on and off, which ones do we really want? What are we trying to achieve? And so you can see by this, you know, really complicated graphic that it it depends. Um, and you can't even say, I well, we want, you know, brown trout. Um, do you want them to be reproductive in a large population? Do you want them to be large? You know, and all of those things require different flow targets. Um, so David talked a lot about the flow targets of the endangered fish, um, but we are working a little more locally on um, what would be our own flow targets. And so this was a study that um, the Roaring Fork Conser Conservancy put together to help me in advocating for how the flows, um, how those releases happen out of Brood Eye Reservoir um, to the degree that we can. And so the culmination of that kind of spider graph that I just showed you came to these really um, basic, more basic numbers that I can use um, when we're working um, month to month or week to week on ideal flows. And um, this is a, a snapshot of what that looks like. And so if you kind of quickly glance at these things, our optimum flow range is somewhere around 100 CFS most of the time, um, depending on what we're trying to accomplish. Just like David was saying, ideally, you know, we're looking at the frying pan um, as a fishery because one, that's a good indicator of a healthy river system when it's producing the type of fish that it should be producing. Um, and also because that's an economic driver for our area. Um, but also we're looking at just the um, other needs of the river from anchor ice production or reduction of anchor ice production to um, 
flushing flows, which, you know, David hinted at that that can create cottonwood galleries, which creates healthier riparian areas. It washes out sediments and builds new beds for um, fish population and macro invertebrates. There's, so they're, they're, it's extremely complicated and there are lots of objectives we're trying to, to achieve and we're trying to, to get the most benefit that we can get at any given time while working within the realms of, and the realistic portions of, of that program and the other calls that are being made from, Rudi, from the Bureau out of RUDI. So kind of putting it a little more, uh, a little bit even simpler, um, in, in an ideal world for hydropower production for the city of Aspen's clean energy portfolio, they would be looking at 100 to 300 CFS. And for aquatic, uh, for a healthy aquatic habitat, again, we're looking at getting those flushing flows, which is like once a year for about a week, over 600 CFS, um, keeping our summer flows around 200 CFS, trying to reach uh, or trying to keep the temperatures under 68 degrees. And that's, um, we're looking at the frying pan and the lower roaring fork when we're talking about temperatures. And for anchor ice, having the flow up at 70 CFS helps reduce the anchor ice production. Um, for recreation needs, we need it to be uh, less than 280 CFS for a weightable flow. That's on the frying pan. Boatable flow, they'd like for it to be over 450 CFS on the lower roaring fork. And again, watching those temperatures. And then I talked earlier about we have to meet those minimum stream flows. The Bureau has to meet those. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, temperature as well. This was another joint project with the Roaring Fork Conservancy. Um, so temperatures are tricky, and that's certainly um, some a, a big change that we're seeing as our climate, um, cli as, as we're experiencing climate change. We're seeing that we're dealing with less water, so we definitely have more dry years, and dry years mean that there's less water in the river. We're also dealing with higher ambient air temperatures, and that combination increases the temperature of the water, and particularly increases the temperature of the water in the lower roaring fork. And because of that increase in temperature, it's very stressful for the aquatic life that we have there. And we see closures from our um, partnering agencies like CPW in order to protect and preserve that aquatic life. And those closures also have economic impacts and recreational and, and kind of, you know, our um, enjoyment of the river. But it also brings pressure to our area if the rivers nearby are being closed for temperature um, sooner than our own rivers are, then we get that increased pressure um, from those that are trying to recreate on those other rivers. And so we worked with the Conservancy and a consultant um, to help pr predict what might happen in uh, the next week. So we can look at, you know, if the air temperature is this, and we know that the flows that um, David's asking for and other contract water rights holders are asking for out of Rudai Reservoir to be a certain flow, then we can somewhat predict what the water temperature may be. And then we can modify those releases. And so we work, you know, in this really large network of people on the Western Slope, of water managers on the Western Slope, working together to try to meet all of these goals of all of our rivers. And so then we can ask for those um, shifts in, you know, a, a different water temperature. And we have worked um, really successfully and creatively with partners to not only agree to that those kinds of water releases, but also to get that water out of Rudai Reservoir. As I was mentioning at the very beginning, Rudai is a compensatory storage reservoir. Its job is not to um, make sure that rivers are flowing. Its job is to meet the the, the water rights of downstream water rights holders. And so the only way that the Bureau is legally allowed to let water go out of those rivers is to meet those minimum stream flows that they are required to meet, and then to release water when someone that owns or contracts water in Rudai asks for it. And so um, we worked really collaboratively with several partners who have small amounts of water in Rudai to get those releases to happen, um, therefore cooling the temperature of the Roaring Fork River. And that creativity catches the eye of people across the country who are looking for um, 
ways to deal with climate change and, and the increase in, in um, dry weather, the increase in temperatures and, and the effects that that's having on our rivers. And so this summer I was able to um, talk with Senator Bennett for a, a little while um, and my board about how um, the impacts of climate change on Root Eye Reservoir and um, how important these programs are, like Dave's talking about, that continues to pull water out of root eye um, so that we have water flowing in all of these rivers, but also that that um, program has to be partnered with um, those who uh, locally who understand the impacts of what's happening on the ground so that we can, um, you know, not solve one problem by creating another so that we are creatively and collectively and collaboratively trying to solve all of the all of the problems that our communities are experiencing um which fish is that day <laughs> that's a humpback chub right we're still looking at your picture with Senator Bennett, April. Oh, I'm sorry. There we go. There we go. <laughs> something. Yes, thank you. The humpback chub thanks you. That's <laughs> put down a black box, and that's a much better picture than I showed at the chub. So appreciate <laughs> it. That's a good one. I stole it from the Colorado Water Trust. Perfect. Well, I really want to thank you both, uh, David and April, for a very informative presentation on a very complex system. It's really hard to answer in like 30 seconds a question about why frank, frank pan flows are changing different times of the year. And so this is this is an excellent tool for us to be able to reference even into the future. So I just want to be mindful of time. It is 6.30. So those of you that need to go, we totally understand. But if there are any questions, this is a great time to ask that. We will take a, have a couple of minutes here for questions. And I'm getting a few. Okay, real quick. Um, from Mark. Can April give a quick summary of the invasive species program at Root Eye? Great question. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. So um, uh, there are invasive species all over the United States. The one that poses the biggest threat to our reservoirs and rivers right now are mussels. And Colorado has, up until the last two years, been a completely mussel-free state. Um, the mussels, or zebra and quagga mussels, and they're proliferating in um, reservoirs throughout the western U.S., but there's a huge population of them in Lake Powell, and those little tiny mussels, um, they basically have no predators, and they, um, they breed like rabbits. They're worse than rabbits. There needs to be a new saying for breeding like mussels. And they clean the entire they um, clean the entire water body of any good nutrients within it, and they attach to infrastructure, and you can't get them off really easily. And so they're huge, huge harmful impact to reservoirs. And we're trying very hard in Colorado to keep Colorado free of those mussels. Rawapa runs the um, program, and so we secure the funding and um, use that funding to have in boat inspections at Root Eye to prevent the spread of mussels um, up into Root Eye Reservoir, especially given the population of Root Eye boaters that also boat at Lake Powell, where they can pick those mussels up. So we have a pretty rigorous inspection program at Root Eye, and um, we have maintained uh, we've been muscle free the whole time we've been providing that inspection program and we catch catch boats that have muscles on them and decontaminate them or turn them around. Great. Thank you, April. David, I have a quick question for you. Um, I'm curious about I really appreciated that you showed that that complex image complex. That's <laughs> that's the theme of the night. That image of the um, the the cameo dam and just where the canals were, where the inputs were coming in and where um, the fish, the fish ladders are. My question is, do you all have cameras on the fish ladders? And how do you count the fish that are coming through and what fish are using that? Great question. We don't have cameras on the fish ladder, but we do have a couple of means. There's um, a portable, uh, pit tag transceiver, so it receives the signals 
and when we when I say a pit tag, it's this passive integrated transponder. It's about the size of a grain of rice that when we catch fish or when we release from from the hatchery, can basically put this little rice grain into the arm pit of the pectoral fin of the fish, um, and then it's tagged. So it's it's just like a barcode on at the supermarket. So we have receivers set up all over the place. The price stubs fit bam down in the valley that the reclamation um, kind of modified a few years ago for fish passage. There's a receiver there. There's one in the um, fish ladders themselves that are portable. And then they also at the, like the cameo at the roller dam, they have what's called a fish kettle at the very top of that. So the fish will make their way up and then they'll, they'll be stuck in the kettle before they basically make it to that last step. So every day, during the summertime, when the fish ladder is on and there's water to activate it, uh, the, the staff here at the Grand Junction local office will go out there and pick the fish that are stuck in that kettle and identify every last one of them. Um, so that's how we make sure that we're passing native fish, we're culling any you know bass or pike that wants to try to get through there, um, and then the listed fish and most a lot of the non-native or the native but not listed fish like the round tail chub, the flail mouth and blue head, head sucker, these other three species, a lot of them are tagged also. So we're, we're getting so much data now on what's using the passages and it's pretty incredible. I really had no idea how many fish use that thing because it's about a 12 foot, you know, three or four decker ride to go back and forth and back and forth. Um, sometime, you know, when there's a roller dam tour opportunity, all those schematics are gonna be, make a lot more sense. Um, as well as like how the ladder and the screen works as well. So yeah, it's it's heavily managed to to really detail what goes through those ladders. Do you offer dam uh, tours of the roller dam? We could set something up. Yeah, and hmm. we always uh, our partners at GBI or the Grand Valley Water Users, Norcher Mesa. They're just fantastic people to work with. We have uh, really lucky to have such good working relationships with. With all the Grand Valley irrigators, so uh, yeah, we could we could certainly make stuff happen. It might be a fun sort of summer trip for the Roaring Fork folks to come on down to the valley. So for those people that are still on this phone call, if that sounds like something you might be interested in, um, just maybe give me a little hand raise under the reaction um, because I think that would be interesting. But you know, I'm going to need like at least ten or fifteen people to come with me. <laughs> so um, if that's, I have one thumbs up. Through two, mm -hmm. yay! <laughs> Great. Well, maybe. Three, yeah. All right. There's more. So maybe um after tonight, David, we can follow up with you in April and maybe schedule something. And the people that will be the first to hear about it are the people that attended this call. So we can we can offer that to th this crew first. Um, and on that note, just again because we're you know pushing the time here just a little bit, I want to go ahead and close out tonight uh, real quick by just showing you what's coming up here in the next uh, two months. So we do have more Berkshire Watershed Institutes coming up here. You'll see Tuesday, January 30th. That is, um, if you have heard of Dust on Snow, we have the Dust on Snow scientists for the state of Colorado coming to give this presentation on January 30th. That's Jeff Derry. He's the executive director at the Center for Snow and Avalanche Studies in Silverton. So hopefully it won't be dumping that day so that he can make it here because he's got quite a drive to get here. Um, and then February 21st, um, we have Dr. Jeffrey Deems, who actually created this airborne laser mapping, the mountain snowpack. If you've seen articles about airplanes going over the mountains and measuring the snowpack from the airplane, that's this presentation. And oh, it's going to be so cool. So hopefully you can make that. And then Tuesday, oops, I just realized I left the date off of there, February 27th, um, we will have Barry Nearing, who's a retired aquatic researcher from Colorado Parks and Wildlife. He has been studying whirling disease for the last 30 years. I have been told that he is the guy. You want to come in here, um, talk about whirling disease. He's got all the information. Um, so we're excited to have them. If you're not already receiving them uh, every Thursday afternoon, we release a weekly river and snowpack report year round, um, holidays included. So you can reach read that on our website, on our social media pages, but you can also get it in your inbox every Thursday afternoon. So go to our website, 
to check out that information. And um, I really would like to kindly ask you all to consider becoming a monthly base flows member. We provide, I think we've provided all of our Berkshire Watershed Institutes for free except one. And so our intention is to keep it that way, but we would love um, for you to continue supporting our work as you are able. And you can see the link there um, to the website where you are able to do that. So. Thank you again, everyone, for attending. And once again, David and April, we really thank you for your time. Thank you for the work that you're doing for us. And then, you know, if people have questions, um, there'll be ways, um, we'll let them know ways that they can get in touch with you in case they have any more detailed questions. Thanks yeah. again, everybody. Thanks. Have a great evening. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thanks for